Well, we're in Philippians this morning, starting Philippians. Paul wrote this letter also while in prison in Rome. He, uh, uh, it's a, uh, another letter that doesn't have a lot of what you might call uh, more of a familiar letter, uh, maybe, than the others. So that's kind of encouraging, uh, kind of an encouraging letter. The church in Philippi helped Paul. Uh, numerous ways it appears and he was very close to that church he says um, basically in this that he that he wants to be his joy wants to be complete because of the same mind and I think that's something we see we see that in verse 2 complete being of the same mind maintaining the same love united in spirit intent on one purpose you know, that's a real plea of the Bible and of biblical writers. And there was division even early on in the church, um, really early on, first century, uh, end of the first century. There was a big council at the end of, end of the first century, if you studied that stuff. And uh, it was a source of controversy. And, and really the source of that council and the, the controversy of that council was the deity of Christ. It was the idea of Christ being God's son and how that ranked. If Christ was equal to God or less than God and the Holy Spirit, and that was really what that council was about, and that was really late first century. So you, those divisions started early. Um, all through early Christianity, there was some divisions, uh, things that uh, uh, went against the unity. Uh, Gnosticism started to come in uh, into the first century, second century. Uh, this Gnostic idea, Gnostic belief started to, come in about the time that John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, so Gnosticism became a point of division. Uh, uh, the idea of, of Christ, the de deity of Christ, and that, and that really kind of is what stemmed Gnosticism was that idea. You know, how does Christ, can Christ be God? Can Christ be equal to God? And how does that, and, and is that true? And how can that be? And you know, that's something I think we struggle with today, and they struggled with it back then. It's a hard concept, so that caused a lot of issues. You know, who is, who is Christ, actually? You know, that was a big question. Uh, you know, God in the flesh, we know that. But on the other hand, you know, uh, he spoke of God in a separate personality. I speak to God. I do the will of my Father. Very, very difficult, isn't it? To, and we struggle with that same ideology, that same thing. So... So um, Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, Stephen said. Uh, you know, uh, in the throne room of God, who's worthy to open the seals? And one appeared as a lamb been slain. Jesus came in to open the seals of the scroll. So even though we say, you know, God and Jesus are one and the Holy Spirit is one, we see separate personalities in that, in that Godhead. And that's, and that's very difficult to, to comprehend and to understand how that works, that they're one. And yet... Paul here appeals to that. He says one in mind, one in unity, one in spirit. In other words, one thought, one, one idea. The Bible says when a man and woman are married, the two shall become one flesh. It doesn't mean they're the same person necessarily. They're still two distinct personalities, but you kind of get the idea of what the Bible means or what God means by that statement, that they should become of one mind, one purpose, one spirit. So, you know, I think... Um, that was something they struggled with, we struggle with. Some of that division had already started to come in by the time of Philippi. This is pretty light. Paul's in, in Rome in prison. This is a pretty light book. So, you know, Judaism was still in effect here. The temple was still in in Jerusalem. So Judaizers, Judaism was still a problem here. But you got to remember, Philippi is a Gentile church, a Greek church. So... Not quite the same uh, influence as, if, as the Roman church or as the church in Jerusalem, I might say. I'm sorry, church in Jerusalem. So there was division, and Paul's encouraging them here <coughs> to be united. And he does that because he says we should be humble, humility, not selfishness or empty, empty conceit. To regard one another as more important than yourselves. So this idea of loving each other, and that's really the, a biblical Old Testament idea, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, and the question was, well, who's my neighbor? You know, get into the story of the of the uh, of the uh, Good Samaritan. Am I starting to? How did I do that? 
Hmm. Well, I guess I got two twice. Huh. I guess we'll have to open our Bibles, won't we? Sorry about that. Good catch. Good catch. Sorry about that. Models absolutely stuck there. There we go. Okay, so I guess we should start at the beginning. That's a good place to start, as it says in the sound of music. <laughs> so Paul and Timothy together here um, in Rome. Yeah, this is a better place to start. I was kind of off. Uh, started together in Rome. Uh, addresses this to overseers and deacons, which is, uh, or including overseers and, deacon, and deacons, which I think that was kind of interesting. He called that out, and some scholars talk about that idea there, uh, the idea of elders and deacons. Um, you know, whether he said that, including them, because he wanted it to be to all people plus them and not just to them, you now that's a possibility. But um, it's kind of interesting that he opens that way. Um, the idea here of the office, not the, uh, not the, uh, not just the name, and I think that's important. You know, when you start talking about those names in the Greek, uh, you know, when it talks about um, in Acts, when it talks about deaconesses, or you know, the word deacon, dekanos in the Greek is uh, servant. So it's one of those words in the Bible. And Buck texted me last night about, you know, the word apostle. Um, those words are. In the Greek, they can either mean an office or they can just be descriptive. So, in other words, if you said, you know, a servant girl, uh, that would still be the same word. A servant, dekanos in the Greek, would still be the same word as, as to say it was a deacon. So, we have to make the distinction in Scripture whether it's talking about the office or whether it's just talking about a servant. Same way with apostle. We have to make a decision about whether it's talking about one called or whether it's talking about the office, one called by Jesus. So there's two different connotations with those words. So those are things you have to consider. It's the same way with the word elder. The word elder in the Bible, the Greek word for elder, can either mean one aged or it can mean the office of elder. It can go either direction. So, uh, so those words sometimes can be uh, two different ways. So... We have to make distinctions uh, in text and by, by the context, whether we're talking about the descriptive of the word or whether we're talking about the office. Uh, the office. So when you read your Bible, when you go through that, generally if it's the office, uh, like apostle, it'll be capitalized if it's the office um, as opposed to not being the office, as opposed to just being one called. So, so there's uh, ways that you can, and even when Paul refers to himself as the elder, Sometimes there's, there's controversy. Do you actually mean like he's an elder or does he just mean the aged Paul, the old Paul, right? So you can go two different ways when you look at those ideas. But in this case, it's the office. We know that by context because he talks about including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he talks about the prayer, always offering prayer with joy. In view of your participation in the gospel, from the first day until now. And that word participation, that's a great translation in the New American Standard. The idea of sharing it, uh, that's what it means, sharing in the gospel. And I think when Paul says this, because if you look at the beginning of Philippians, the end of Philippians, uh, you know, when Paul talks about participation in the gospel, he means it, I think, on several different levels, not just the idea of they're still in the gospel or preaching the gospel, but he also means, if you look at the end of Philippians, he's talking about the idea that they, that they participate in it by supporting Paul, by, by the support, financial support they give. So I think when you look at the book of Philippians, and the church in Philippi, there's two different ideas there. 
You know, they're supporting it in multiple ways. You can support the gospel in a lot of ways. You can support the gospel by preaching the gospel or teaching the gospel or living the gospel, but you can also support the gospel by supporting people who preach the gospel and teach the gospel. So there's different ways to, to participate. I think that's a come and use that word, that you participate in it. You don't just share the gospel. You know, you don't, he could say you share the gospel. It's more than sharing. They're participating in the gospel. So I think that's why he uses that word uh, right here in this context. He says um, that, there, that it'll be perfected. The work will be perfected in them. Confident this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. And, of course, he there being capitalized, Christ who began the work. Paul was instrumental in the church in Philippi. But Paul understands that the foundation has to be Jesus Christ. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3. The foundation has to be Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. And that's kind of that same idea, participants of grace, partakers of grace. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So it's kind of an introductory, but a lot of things there. Paul probably longs to be with them because he's in prison. He knows he can't be with them. And I think that probably increases his desire to be with them when he knows that he can't. So, you know, the imprisonment cost him a lot that way. Timothy's with him. Timothy uh, will probably stay with him through most of this imprisonment. Timothy might have actually penned some of this. In his second imprisonment, Timothy will not be with him. That's when you get the book of Second Timothy. And that's when he t asked Timothy to come to him and bring his cloak and bring his parchment. The last book of Paul. So... This is a little bit different imprisonment here. Uh, house arrest, a little more free to do what he wants to do. And Paul is making the best uh, of the situation here. I want you to know, brother, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. So this guard that's keeping him, and now there's some there's discussion about this, whether it just means the guard that is basically guarding him every day, or whether it's through like the whole, it kind of gives you the idea, it's all oh, this spreading, right? The guards are spreading this news, spreading this message. So Paul, even in his imprisonment, is spreading the gospel of Christ in Rome. Uh, I always, every time I read this, I always think, I always think about uh, Jay Riley uh, when Glenda was so sick that time. And this, always when I read this passage, Riley always comes to my mind. Because he was up there, you know, day and night, and he was in that, uh, up at St. Francis, and he was in that little waiting room area thing. And, and, and O'Reilly just began his own ministry right there, you know. I mean, he actually baptized somebody out of that, you know. Somebody got baptized out of that, and he was uh, answering the phone and taking messages and, and relaying and praying with people. And, I mean, and Riley just had this ministry going on in this waiting room. And... Uh, I would always think about that when I think about Paul being in prison, you know, uh, because he was in prison, but yet he was doing all these things. That's just exactly what Riley did. You know, he was more or less in prison up there, but he was probably doing more good spreading the gospel in that waiting room than he would have been if he would have been home, you know, and that just that was just his heart. And I've always really admired that about him, and it was just uh, it was pretty amazing to see it, I, I thought, pretty amazing to see it. They were, uh, he had a lot of affection for those people, and they had a lot of affection for him, and you could tell that when you, uh, when you would go up there, the way they would speak of him. So, you know, I think there's lessons in that for us. Wherever, wherever we're at, you know, we can share Christ, and, and I think there's just a great lesson for us in that, that, you know, our circumstances, sometimes God puts us in some, maybe in some bad circumstances because maybe there's somebody there that we need to reach. Sometimes we miss our opportunity because we're so caught up in our own pain and our own bereavement and our own problems that we fail to think, well, maybe God just put me here for a purpose, you know, that I need to be doing more than this. So I always thought that was a good, always think about Riley. I always think about my mother when I read this too. She's the same way. 
Doesn't matter where she's at. She breaks down, something bad happens, she's looking for God in it. She's looking for what did God put me here to do, you know? So uh, I always think about her too. So I, that's good Good lessons for us, good good example. Um, but there's two different groups in this Paul talks about in this imprisonment. There's two different groups of Christians. One, on one hand, it says, Most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So on one hand, he says, this one group, this first group of people, he says they're more confident because they see that I'm in prison, but not all Christians are going to prison. And even though I'm in prison, you know, it doesn't look it's going to wind up like I'm going to die for this. So it gives them some confidence, you know. They're like, well, you know, Paul's in prison. If Paul can go to prison, then it's all right. Um, so I think, you know, he said on one hand, there's this one group that they have confidence because I'm in prison, and they're more confident in preaching the gospel. They're less afraid now that I'm in prison to go up and spread the gospel and preach the gospel. But then Paul says, and this is the hard, this is kind of hard for me to understand, um, but he says this other group, are preaching Christ from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, which are the ones that do it for goodwill. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So what exactly does Paul mean by that group? The ones who are doing it from um, envy and strife, and that are doing it from uh, selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. You know, that's kind of hard for me to understand. What are they doing? Well, how are they causing Paul distress in his imprisonment by preaching the gospel uh, from selfish motives? Yeah, that's one thing I think to stir up trouble. But he does say that they're doing it. They're still preaching it, right? He does say it. And if you read a little further here, it says, What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. I think, this is Rex's opinion. You're welcome to your own. But I think that what Paul meant here is that he was distressed because these people, they're causing him distress because he's in prison and he can't do anything about them doing it wrong. You know, they're doing it for the wrong reasons, but I can't do anything about it. I'm in prison. I can't, they're causing me distress. I'm distressed. I need to be out there fixing this problem, but I can't, right? I'm in prison. So how can I get out and fix all these problems that are going on when I'm I'm the one in prison here. I can't get out and fix it. That's not what most scholars think. But to me, it makes a lot more sense. Because I don't see how they can proclaim the gospel and cause Paul more problems. He's already in prison. I mean, what are they What are they doing, right? Any thoughts on this, Gary? No, I don't know. It's hard to understand, but that's what I think. I think Paul's stuck in prison, and these people are preaching the gospel with this selfish ambition and, and, and envy and and he's like, and that's causing him issues. You know, I think it would cause any of us issues to see somebody preaching it in a way, it does me, cause somebody that was preaching a gospel in a way that it shouldn't be for the wrong motives. They were still preaching the same gospel. Paul doesn't say they're not preaching the right gospel. He doesn't say they're not doing good, but he says it's distressing to me because here I am stuck, and I can't do anything about their fault that they're not doing it out of love. You know, to me, that makes more sense, and most scholars do not agree with me. But you're welcome to your own interpretation. But I, but I, that's what it means. That's what how I always took it. You know, he's just distressed because he's stuck and he can't fix what's going on. I think that's one of the most frustrating things to be in a position where you know there's things you need to fix, things you need to do, and you're stuck in a place that you can't you can't do it. Paul's that way a lot, isn't he? That's why he writes all these letters. He's like. You know, you're distressing me. You're perplexing me. You're, you're, uh, you know, <laughs> you need to straighten up. I need to be there, right? Because you, you people have, are really messing this up. <laughs> so, uh, so Paul, 
I think that caused Paul a lot of distress. But he says what he says in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. And I think that's a I think it's what Paul has to do. He has to say, regardless, I'm going to be happy about it. The gospel is being proclaimed. Uh, I'm going to be happy about this, and and uh, because at least it's, at least it's being proclaimed, even if it's somebody's preaching the gospel from the wrong motive. At least they're preaching the gospel, right? And at least people can respond to the gospel, and that's. And that's how come Paul's rejoicing. He says, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the Spirit. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, that with all boldness Christ will even now is always be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. You know, Paul doesn't have the same uh, tone. It, when you get into 2 Timothy, uh, the second imprisonment, you know, his tone is much more somber. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time is coming to an end. Paul kind of knows the second time it's not going to go well. But this time, he is hopeful, and he does portray that in his writings. I'm hopeful. Christ's deliverance, you know, pray for me. It's going to work out for the best. You kind of see the optimism in Paul in this first imprisonment. When you get into Second Timothy, you just don't see that optimism anymore. He's resigned himself. I think to what's going to happen and I think he kind of knows what's going to happen in the second imprisonment but here he does portray hope because he will get out of this he will get out of this imprisonment for to me to live is Christ to die is gain but if I am to live on in the flesh this will mean fruitful labor for me I do not know which to choose I think it's interesting he says that which to choose uh, you know I don't know that it's his choice <laughs> but he, uh, but I think he means wish to choose in his mind. You know, which would I rather do? Would I rather stay here or would I rather go on? Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your prayers and joy in the faith. So you can kind of see the optimism in this letter a little bit. So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come see whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction. So in this case of Philippians, he's the church in Philippi has sent this gift to him. You know, that's kind of the context of this letter. They've sent this gift to him, and now, you know, he's writing this letter, and he's going to send this letter back. We'll get into that uh, Wednesday night. And now he's writing this letter, and he's going to send this letter back to them. So they've sent him a gift, and they sent it with the guy, Rapiditus. He's sick. He got sick, almost died. And Paul's going to send this letter back with him. But the church in Philippi had sent him this gift when he was in this Roman imprisonment. And that's what prompted, that's what's prompted this letter. So that's how come we're getting this letter. Because he's going to send this back to him. Now I need to go back to where I was. Honey. Now we're in two. Well, I say we are. We will be. There we are. Now we're in two. So he encourages them to be together, to be one. Um, he encourages them not to be like the ones that he talked about in one, from selfish or empty conceit. He encourages them to be humble, as Paul always does in every letter, and to put others ahead of their ahead of themselves, which is exactly what Christ did. So Paul encourages them to be Christ-like, encourages them to put each other first not to do things from selfish ambition or from empty conceit, which is exactly what he criticized those ones that were preaching the gospel for in Philippians 1, exactly what he criticized them for. And then he says, his own he existed in the form of God. And see, that's interesting that he brings that up right after he brings up this unity idea. He existed, and this is where we get this, Philippians 2, and it's something I go to a lot, um, he emptied himself, Philippians 2, 7, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. How difficult is this? What is he saying? 
He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, found in the appearance of man, humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. But he is God. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, I think the key to this is that he emptied himself. You know, he didn't come as a God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh, but he didn't come as God. He came as man. You know, the Holy Spirit entered into him in his baptism, and he, and he had the, all the gifts of the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure, John says. But on the other hand, he was uniquely human. He had to be. He had to be human to, to relate to us, to what we have to go through. The Hebrew writer says, that he was tempted in all ways as we are, and yet without sin. That's a huge thing. You know, so many times you think, well, God didn't, you know, Christ didn't sin because he was God on earth and he couldn't sin. But as Gary's brought up and others, you know, why did the Satan tempt him? You know, why would you tempt him if he couldn't sin? Why would you tempt him if he couldn't give in to sin? And the Hebrew writer really brings that up. He was tempted in all ways and yet didn't sin. So in that respect, then, is it possible to live a sinless life? Well, I mean, but he was uniquely human, right? You know, I think that's a real point sometimes that we miss. He was tempted in all ways that we are, it says. And yet, without sin, yet he did not sin. Right. right, but we didn't. We the idea, and I think the the deal here is not to give in to our sinful nature. You know, we we have to be above that. You know, yeah, right. Well, the three. I would have to go back and look at that, right? Couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But, um, you know, the idea of, you know, the idea of the Trinity is really, you know, Trinity is not a word ever used in the Bible. That's a word we made to kind of describe that relationship of the Godhead, you know. Um, the idea of three and one is not really a biblical espoused directly you know it's it's implied i guess <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah right right theoretically absolutely if you're in the grace of god you're in god's eyes you're sinless yeah absolutely no. Jerry Radabaugh did. She always used to come beat on my door when we talked about this. Go ahead, Gary. Right, Jesus was divine, immaculately conceived. But he didn't perform any miracles except for his teaching in the temple at 12, which you might say in some ways maybe that was a miraculous teaching. We don't know.
Yeah, well, even at the cross where he said, I could call 10,000 angels, not call 10 legions of angels, you know. Like you said, that's submitting to your humanity when you don't do that. I think my humanity would have called the 10 legions of angels. <laughs> angels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he wept like a man. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. He had the same desires and emotions that that we have. That's exactly what the Hebrew writer says. He was tempted in all ways that we are. You know, in other words, he had the same desires of the flesh that we all have. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty plain. You know, the idea of Jesus emptying himself, taking on the form, leaving heaven. The Bible speaks about that. Leaving the glory I had before the world, you know, to be with you. You know, John says, in the beginning was the word. You know, there's a lot There's a lot tied up in that and a lot that, uh, you know, we have. it really expands your view of Christ, you know, of who he is and what he is. Um, you know, and I think when you limit Christ to being that baby that was born in a manger in Bethlehem, you really take away the divinity, as Gary would say, the divinity of God, the divinity of Christ, that he existed before, emptied himself, took on the form of a human, born as a human into the world. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot encompassed uh, in that idea, for sure. Um, It says the reason God exalted him, bestowed on the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven on earth and under the earth. And that just means everyone, everything, good, bad, evil, righteous, unrighteous, devils, demons, angels, all are going to be submissive to Christ. Um, and that name and the power of that name uh, in Jesus, that all these things will be subjected to him. Uh, and it's that same thing. I think you really see that in Revelation where who's worthy, there was no one found worthy, and then there appeared as a lamb been slain, and that verse always came to my mind. You know, why was Jesus worthy? Because he did what he did. You know, he was the only one that ever did that. Nobody else is ever going to do that. Nobody else will ever have to do that. He did something, and in, in, uh, he did something that no, that no other, how do you want to say it, person, God, human, man, has ever done or ever, will ever do you know and that's how come he's worthy because he did that he did what had to be done to be worthy to do that and because of that he got that and, and, and then this is Sidney's favorite verse of the Bible every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord so that my beloved uh, so that my legends you've always obeyed is in my presence now much more in my absence work at your salvation with fear and trembling I think that's a I think that's an amazing verse. I think, I think uh, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at that verse a lot in my life um, because it really goes against a lot of what I was taught as a child, the idea that you're once saved, always saved, that, you know, salvation, if you're saved, you're saved, and yet here Paul says to work it out. What do you think he means by that? I thought if he's baptized into Christ, you were saved, and that's all there was to it. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe more to it than that. <laughs> Daily. It. You know, your salvation is a lifelong battle between you and Satan every day. It's not a it's not a one time thing. I mean, as a kid, that's how I was taught, you know, is that you're you know, once saved, always saved. Once if you're saved, you can't fall. But the Bible just doesn't teach that. And I think this is one of the most powerful verses on that. To work out your salvation. You daily work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We can always fall. As Buck says, we can step out of that grace. And so that's something we had to consider. Yeah. Yeah, like Gary says, the responsibility is on you. You have to work out your salvation. I can't work that out for you. An elder can't work that out for you. You know, that's something you have to do. That's your responsibility. And, you know, that's something that really puts, people don't like to hear that. We don't like to be responsible for things like that, do we? <laughs> we would just as soon not be responsible for things like that. But the Bible's real plain that that's our, our decision. It's our, Paul says that. To work it out, you know. Fear and trembling. 
how important is your salvation, right? More important than anything else in your life. You know, fear and trembling. I mean, that's how it tells you what Paul says it's important. You know, it's something we should worry about. We should think about it. Uh, consider it. Uh, carry it with us in our lives. So I think that's a, it's a really strong verse. For God's at work with you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling, so you'll prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God. Above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Do it without, without grumbling. You don't just have to do it. You have to be happy about it. Just telling you. That's the way it is with God. You don't just have to do God things. You have to be happy about doing God things. Don't grumble about it, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's a little bit tougher, right? <laughs> to be happy about these things we do. And that's, it. that's what Paul admonishes us to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, a right heart and a right attitude. You know, it's not just about doing the right thing. It's about having the right attitude with it, you know. And I think that's huge. And you know, I think it's something that it's easy to miss as a Christian. You know, you can do everything right. But it can all be wrong if your heart ain't where your heart needs to be. And that's hard to us to, to understand. I think I, we read that the other day or Wednesday night about honor your father and mother, you know. And I think it would be really easy to, to it's really easy to uh, take care of your father and mother and not honor them. I mean, it's a big difference in that, you know, to meet their needs and yet not give them any honor, not give them any glory. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, you have people, and I guess we've all had people do it, and I know I'm bad about that. I get impatient sometimes, and I shouldn't, and, you know, that's one of my flaws. I'm sometimes in too big of a hurry, and, and I know that's one of my flaws that I have to work on, but. You know, or you're right. You got to do it with the right heart and the right mind, and that's really what Paul says. So, you know, the heart's what should drive the works of Jesus in our lives. And we're out of time, but uh, we'll talk more about this Wednesday night. Thanks for your time this morning. <laughs>